Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, Hill Dickinson's seminar on medical cannabis uh, and the legal framework and investment opportunities for that. Delighted that you're all able to join us. I hope everybody can hear OK. My name's Jamie Foster. I'm a partner in the health and life sciences team at Hill Dickinson. Um, delighted to welcome you to the first in our series of life sciences webinars, which are going to take place through the autumn and into the spring. We've got some exciting other topics uh, to follow, including uh, webinars on cell and gene therapy, uh, med tech, reproductive technologies and clean meat. Uh, other suggestions are welcome, uh, but it's going to be an exciting series. And we thought that, that what would be better to kick it off than a session on uh, the hottest topic at the moment, medical cannabis. The format for the session uh, this morning is a short uh, talk from me about the legal framework, really just to set the scene for uh, how we've got to where we are today in terms of the legalities of the medical cannabis sector. Uh, we then have, uh, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Michael Sodegren, uh, who's going to talk about his work with Sapphire Medical Clinics. Um, and then my colleague Michael Corcoran from our corporate team is going to talk about some of the uh, investment opportunities and the investment landscape uh, in the UK, which has, uh, as many of you will know, I'm sure, uh, changed recently. There will be time, hopefully, at the end for some questions and answers uh, and some discussions. So if you have questions, please do uh, put them into the, the chat and uh, we'll try and answer as many as we can. Uh, for those that we're not able to answer, we'll try and follow up with you afterwards. Uh, and we will send some further follow up details at the end of the webinar. So hopefully that is what everybody uh, on this webinar is hoping to hear this morning. Um, and uh, I've put some housekeeping slides up here. It'd be great if you could uh, comply with those. Unfortunately, I'm not able to uh, suggest where the fire exits are or uh, where we can meet for coffee and networking afterwards, such is the world at the moment. But these are still important housekeeping points. So the first part of the session is about the UK legal framework and uh, the summary message here really is that it, it is pretty complex and confusing. Uh, uh, and as we go through the slides, you'll see that there's a 60 year history of the way that drug laws have developed in the UK, uh, which which is fairly complicated, but I'm going to try and simplify things for you this morning. So the key points are on this slide. As of the 1st of November 2018, I'm sure everybody is aware of this, it's lawful in the UK for cannabis based products for medicinal use in humans, CBPMs, to be ordered by prescription or otherwise and supplied to be administered to patients without a controlled drugs license. And that latter point is particularly important as we'll come on to. Um, some other points to note are that a patient can only be prescribed CBPMs by a specialist doctor who is on the GMC specialist register. And at the moment, most CBPMs do not have marketing authorization, as you typically find for medicines, uh, and are ordered as specials. It's important to note that the NHS, uh, notwithstanding the legal legality of CBPMs, does take a cautious approach and is taking a cautious approach uh, in the way that it, it wants to let medical cannabis um, be prescribed on the NHS. Uh, and we'll come on to that a little bit later. Nevertheless, slowly but surely, changes are being made to the legal framework to open up the market um, and to expand treatment opportunities. And Dr. Michael Sodegren is going to give you some of the way that's happening. So uh, it's a positive and optimistic picture at the moment, and that's a key message that we'd like to get across today. So where does it all begin? Well, it all begins in legal terms uh, with an international treaty, in particular the single convention on narcotic drugs from 1961. And the key thing that that, that convention did was uh, classify uh, drugs according to different types. And in the UK, it's the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971, so a uh, nearly 50 year old uh, piece of legislation that describes and sets the framework is the cornerstone of UK laws around uh, around drugs. And this act classifies controlled drugs according to relative harmfulness, 
classes A, B and C, with cannabis being in B, as we'll come on to look at. And crucially, it prohibits, restricts and criminalises the import, export, production and supply, possession and cultivation of cannabis. But there is a, a an exception in there and a note that activities may be permitted if carried out subject to a license. So even back in 1971, uh, that was anticipated. But this is the core piece of legislation uh, that controls particular types of drugs. So the Class B designation uh, includes various drugs, but also cannabis. And Schedule 2, Part 2 of the 1971 Act does list uh, I've helpfully put a picture of a cannabis plant there, does list uh, cannabis uh, and the different uh, aspects of cannabis that are caught within Schedule 2. So crucially, cannabis, the plant or any part except the mature stalk, fibre uh, and seeds. So that crucially means the flower and leaves are caught within Schedule 2, cannabis resin, uh, CBPN and uh, various derivatives. So there's a clear list in Schedule 2 uh, as to what is caught within uh, the Class B designation and is very broad. Um, I'm sure people have questions about CBD. How does CBD fit into all of this? Um, uh, one of the, uh, the most um, uh, uh, talked about areas of the cannabis sector, but also one of the most confusing in particular legally, so CBD is a non-psychoactive cannabinoid found in cannabis. So there are, uh, depends on uh, various numbers have been quoted for this, but anything upwards of 100 uh, cannabinoids in cannabis and CBD is one of these. Um, there are huge amounts of products on the market, as you will all know, claiming positive health effects for CBD. But if we look at it from a very uh, strictly legal point of view, the key point is that CBD in its pure form is not scheduled or controlled under the Misuse of Drugs Act. The, the difficulty is that the Home Office takes a very cautious approach as to how CBD can be designated to be uh, in a pure form. And really where this leads to is that it's very difficult for CBD not to be uh, classified as a controlled drug. Now, there are uh, that that will, of course, lead to questions about why there are so many products out there on the market that claim to have CBD. But really, that's slightly beyond the remit of this talk today. Suffice to say uh, that as the last bullet point shows, uh, it's a complex picture as regards CBD. So following on from the 1971 Act, uh, the next big change in drug laws came with the Misuse of Drugs Regulations 2001. Um, uh, it's a uh, we're referencing uh, laws here, so it's important that we have a picture of the House of Parliament, as lawyers like to do on slides. Um, and the Misuse of Drugs Regulations takes the 1971 Act a bit further, allocates controlled drugs to one of five schedules, um, and includes the various cannabis products under Schedule One. Um, the key point about these regulations are that they specify that cultivation, production, supply and possession of Schedule 1 drugs is only lawful where the person engaging in these activities holds a Home Office licence. So uh, I mentioned that the 1971 Act included uh, a facility for, um, for a licensing regime for use of controlled drugs and these regulations permit for that. So these were uh, a helpful and important step in loosening um, uh, the ways in which controlled drugs could be used in the UK. Um, the next significant change came with the 2018 regulations, and these are absolutely crucial because they fundamentally changed the law in relation to CBMPs and they removed them from the more strict controls for cannabis. Uh, they moved them from schedule, uh, from schedule one under the 2001 regulations to schedule two. And the effect of that is that the, uh, this allowed for CBMPs to be ordered, prescribed and administered, provided that they had marketing authorization, were used in a clinical trial, or are specials ordered by and supplied to a specialist doctor. So the, these are the crucial regulations. Uh, it took a long time, but that recognised that, that medical cannabis can be uh, ordered and prescribed. 
So that's the, the latest piece of law that has taken us to where we are now. I mentioned earlier on the approach in the NHS, and the NHS uh, has been looking at medical cannabis since that change in the law. And in particular, there was some nice guidance came out last year, uh, which considered um, CBMPs quite carefully. And this slide sets out where NICE got to. So it was a fairly narrow approach that NICE recommended. Um, and as you all, all probably realize and understand, uh, NICE guidance is particularly important and drives the way that the NHS approaches medicines and whether they can be prescribed. So in some sectors, there is some disappointment about the, the NICE guidance because uh, it didn't, for example, um, recommend that uh, CBMPs should be used for chronic pain management or, for example, severe epilepsy. Uh, and, it, and it retained a very narrow focus for when particular products uh, with marketing authorizations could be used. So the NHS is taking a slow and steady approach to this, but the private market is uh, developing very quickly. And then the last slide I just want to talk about are some recent developments that have happened this year, which again are absolutely crucial. And one was a relaxation in March um, uh, around import restrictions, which makes it much easier to import specials. And this is really important for um, doctors prescribing CBMPs uh, and has helped enormously. And then uh, the most recent develop development is the um, the development last month, which uh, my colleague Michael is going to talk about in a bit more detail later on, the FCA statement on the listing of medicinal cannabis companies on the main market of the LSE. Uh, and that is a significant step forward uh, in the investment landscape and in providing investment opportunities. So that's where I wanted to end it. A quick canter through 60 years of controlled drug laws in the UK. Uh, and I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Michael Sodergren. Michael, over to you. Thank you very thank much, you very much uh, uh, Jamie, Jamie. And uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to speak on this webinar. Um, I'm just getting some echoes. I wonder if everyone can mute. Uh, that would be helpful. Thank you. Great. Um, so a little bit of uh, background about myself. Uh, I'm, I'm a doctor. I'm an academic clinician at uh, Imperial College, uh, where uh, I operate on liver and pancreas cancer for the most part. Um, but I became interested in medical cannabis on the research uh, side initially, uh, where we were looking at the effects of cannabidiol in pancreatic cancer models and how it interacts as an anti-inflammatory agent with some of the chemotherapies that we use. And we've got some really interesting data and that's evolved at Imperial into a really uh, a rather uh, comprehensive research program where we're now looking at a wide variety of other clinical applications such as inflammatory disorders and pain and so on. Um, and um, I also um, have become involved with MEC Life Sciences on the research front, helping them with some of the preclinical and clinical research activities that they do at universities throughout Europe. Um, but um, around about the time when the law changed, um, which is coming up to two years ago, uh, now myself and a group of clinicians at Imperial and other London teaching hospitals realized that uh, it was going to be difficult for patients to access medical cannabis uh, in, in the way that uh, we had it, or it was env envisaged. Um, so at that point, uh, we started work on setting up SAFA Medical Clinics, uh, which was the first CQC approved medical cannabis clinic uh, in the UK, uh, and which is some of the activities in which I'm going to describe uh, in this talk. Um, so over the next uh, 20 or 30 minutes, um, what I'll start off by doing is just a very brief introduction to medical cannabis and what the current landscape is in the UK. Uh, I'm aware that most uh, people on this uh, webinar are not medical, so I'm going to keep the medical details pretty light, but it will touch on some of the conditions that we treat and sort of some of the interesting aspects on how medicines are taken. But then I'll um, also uh, provide an introduction to SAFA Medical Clinics and how we evaluate patients and also touch upon the real world data platform uh, that we have uh, set up. Um, so I'm not going to dwell too much on this. As I said, I understand that most uh, participants are non-medics, but suffice to say that 
the endocannabinoid system uh, is uh, the system in the body that we're targeting with medical cannabis. Uh, the cannabis plant has over 120 natural cannabinoids uh, and they are essential, and THC and CBD are two of them, and they are uh, essentially uh, the uh, tools that we use to manipulate the endocannabinoid system. Uh, as you can see on this slide, the endocannabinoid system is located throughout the body, has a wide range of effects on pretty much all the organ systems. And we are starting to understand uh, how CBD and THC uh, function, how they signal throughout the body, uh, but we're really only starting to scratch the surface of the basic science as to how these uh, uh, chemicals interact, what the other constituents of the plant do from a medical point of view, and so on. Um, so what's the current UK landscape? Well, as Jamie said, uh, the law changed in 1st of November 2018. Um, and that came as, uh, I think, as, I'm safe to say, as a surprise to the majority of the medical profession in that it was a very political decision that was uh, based on uh, a, a, a successful uh, campaign in the media relating to uh, the plight of some young children with treatment resistant epilepsy who had had a very good treatment response to medical cannabis and who were not able to access treatment. But there was very little in the way of uh, consultation with medical groups in the UK prior to the change of the law. There was very little in the, or very little to none in the way of planning for how, as a medical profession, we would uh, train doctors to prescribe these medicines, uh, under what indications we uh, would consider them, how all of this would relate to the private and the NHS sector and so on. So at the moment, there are three licensed uh, uh, medical cannabis products in the UK. That's Sativex, the first one that we use for uh, spasticity in multiple sclerosis. Nabilone is a synthetic that we use to treat chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. And Epidiolex is a uh, CBD isolate uh, that we use to treat uh, epilepsy. And these were the three medicines uh, that were recommended for treatment for these uh, specific when they ruled uh, on whether uh, we should have them available on the NHS at the end of uh, last year. And so for a proportion of multiple sclerosis patients, two childhood epilepsy syndromes, and a subset of patients with chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, in theory, uh, these medicines should be available free on the NHS. The other condition that NICE uh, evaluated at the time, and again, as Jamie touched on, was chronic pain, and whilst the evidence was in favor of efficacy, i.e. that it works as a medicine to treat chronic pain, the real job of the NICE committee is to evaluate cost effectiveness, and particularly if it reaches the 20 to 30,000 pound per quality adjusted life year or quality threshold that we set as a bar for the UK taxpayer to to foot the bill uh, for medicines on the NHS. And so for chronic pain, it did not reach this threshold, although the evidence was quite clear that the efficacy of the medicine was there, i.e. it works. So what we need to get chronic pain on the NHS is some more robust evidence and for costs of the medicines to come down. For everything other than these indications, the medical cannabis products are going to be prescribed on an unlicensed basis, and, that, and in the private sector. Um, insurance companies are not currently reimbursing prescriptions for medical cannabis, and that, I suppose that's important to remember because in Germany, that's the reason why uh, the medical cannabis market has developed uh, as it has, uh, and that's because uh, the medicines themselves are reimbursed by uh, private medical insurance. And finally, on, on this subject, I think that the it's fair to say that the NHS is not likely to adopt medical cannabis for at least the next five years for all of the indications that we treat at least, I'd say more likely a decade. Um, and that's for the simple reason that you need to build up this evidence base and then you need to do this cost effectiveness analysis that NICE does. And all of this takes time. And at the time the law was changed, we were really on the back foot in terms of the evidence that was generated 
uh, and we're really just starting to play catch up with that as an academic medical profession right now. Um, so a little bit more about the sort of the current UK landscape. Well, the, the UK market, as it were, is, is still very much in its infancy. Um, we were, uh, Sapphire Medical Clinics were the first clinic to um, be approved to evaluate patients for medical cannabis by the CQC. Uh, and that was pretty much uh, a year ago now. So really we're only in, despite being two years out from legalization, we're only really in the first year uh, of prescribing in the UK. Uh, but we expect, uh, and we see no reason why, that we shouldn't follow similar trends that have been seen in Australia, Canada, and Germany that are several years ahead of us. Um, what we do know is that there is likely to be large demand from patients to access cannabis-based medicines. Uh, you know, most GPs and doctors, such as myself, that have multiple patients, even prior to the law changing, uh, inquire about the role for medical cannabis in their treatment. Um, there was a, a, a YouGov poll published by the Center for Medicinal Cannabis at the end of last year with a good sample size of over uh, 10,000 people uh, that showed that about 1.4 million people across the UK take medical cannabis to treat a medical symptom, a symptom of a diagnosed medical problem. So this is not recreational. This is not for any other purposes than treating a symptom of a diagnosed medical problem. And so that's obviously a lot of people. Um, the expectation is that we're likely to follow uh, in the footsteps of Canada and Germany and Australia. There are some nuances and some differences in the healthcare systems. And I think that uh, on that basis, we're more uh, aligned with Australia uh, in the UK than, uh, than with Germany or Canada. Uh, and as you can see on the, on the uh, graph on this side, this is, this is how Australia went. So in the first year, there were just 457 patients. Uh, I can tell you that in the UK, uh, there's many more than that for sure, um, but uh, they've seen more or less a 500% uh, uh, increase year on year uh, from second to the third year. And really here in the UK, that's going to be in the private sector uh, and uh, mainly in the private clinics where you have this centralized expertise uh, and where uh, unfortunately the prescriptions are going to be paid for by the patients. So why is the UK market uh, tough? Uh, well, there are a number of factors. Um, so the first is doctors and expertise. You know, when this, uh, when the law changed, there was still a perception that uh, the evidence base was lacking for some indications, not all. There was a, a bias by some, some older doctors in the medical pr profession. Uh, and, and there was a feeling that doctors may may risk a reputation by prescribing uh, CBMPs, uh, but it's also relatively high risk because the medicines are prescribed unlicensed. And so you need appropriate training and you need to have an appropriate clinical governance framework around you to protect yourself as a doctor. Uh, and obviously you need to be able to prescribe them freely and without conflict of interest. Um, then there are some regulatory guidelines. And so when, uh, when the law changed, NHS England and MHRA uh, issued some specific guidelines about prescribing cannabis-based medicines. And they are um, uh, a, a long list of essentially tick boxes that are relatively difficult for a single practitioner to adhere to. Um, and uh, the C CQC registration approval process is, is not straightforward, it's lengthy, and there was a lot of scrutiny, particularly you know, during last year when the, the first uh, clinical activity was being established, and, and rightly so. Um, there have been issues with the supply chain in the UK. It's, it's complicated. The specials companies need various licenses. They've had to only been able to import uh, when there have been prescriptions available, meaning that the quantities are slow, lead times are long, and that also means that it's difficult for patients to get uh, access to medicines um, uh, in a timely manner. And obviously since, since uh, the law changed only two years ago, we only really started prescribing or evaluating patients for the last year. The market size of the patient pool or whatever term you want to attach to it uh, is, is currently small, uh, and, but that is, I think is changing uh, relatively quickly. So, what are the types of conditions uh, for which we can consider medical cannabis? Well, this uh, this is what we uh, this is the list of conditions that we uh, evaluate at Safar Medical Clinics. 
Um, I think I would say that it's safe to say that the vast majority of patients are, are here, pain conditions, psychiatric conditions, and neurological conditions. Um, but there are also some uh, you know, very, very interesting uh, applications that we're starting to look at now which is with an emerging evidence base, uh, uh, such as those uh, related to uh, inflammatory skin problems. Uh, but on a whole, you've got the, the, the chronic pain conditions that we're used to seeing. In psychiatry, I would say that the most uh, common uh, types of patients that we see are those with anxiety and post-traumatic stress. And then neurology, it's a mixture of multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, uh, and Parkinson's. Um, as I said before, and I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, uh, the evidence base for pain is, is, is there. This is, you know, as robust as it can get. This is a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. Uh, it shows that there is, beyond a shadow of a doubt, uh, uh, an effect signal for cannabis-based medicines compared to placebo. Uh, and, and in addition to that, uh, and this is something that we're seeing uh, in the clinic as well, there are significant improvements on other aspects, uh, such as the patient's quality of life with sleep problems and the global impression of how they're feeling. So how are these medicines taken? Uh, well, in the UK, I'd say that uh, at least in our clinic, we prescribe about 95% oils, so tinctures. And so uh, those are uh, products that you place under the tongue and then swallow, and they have an onset of uh, you know, 15 minutes or so. Um, go, they're metabolized uh, via the liver and last between three and six hours. Um, a small number of patients are prescribed flour to be vaporized, and typically those are patients that uh, the pain patients that need a rapid onset uh, of control of symptoms, i.e., like pain. Um, there are a number of other interesting uh, administrations that are coming online, and we're certainly uh, uh, evaluating topicals for uh, dermatological disorders now, uh, and I'm sure this list is just going to grow over the coming years. Um, so brief introduction to, uh, uh, to SAPA Medical Clinics. I mentioned some of the difficulties with the UK market and really the barriers that uh, we identified very early on were that uh, you know, doctors completely lack education in cannabis. And this based on a graduate, there's no postgraduate training curriculum. Uh, and, uh, and it's very, very difficult for doctors to get training in prescribing these relatively complex medicines because uh, it's not like there is just one active pharmaceutical ingredient. Uh, at the very minimum, we're looking at two THC, CBD, and there's really very, very few, if no medicines like that, that we're used to prescribing. Um, furthermore, uh, the prescriptions are going to be unlicensed uh, for the majority, uh, and that uh, is also something uh, that uh, uh, makes doctors more apprehensive. And then I mentioned that there were these guidance that were laid out that you need to adhere to, and it's very difficult to do so as a single practitioner. So we set up Safar Medical Clinics with a view to solving these problems and really um, uh, with a view to doing two main things. And one was to set up a clinical governance system whereby we can really evaluate patients in a robust way as to whether them as an individual where they are in their treatment pathway based on their uh, diagnosed condition and in relation to the best available evidence, if they would be suitable for a trial of cannabis-based medicines. And I'll describe a little bit how we go about that. Um, but hand in hand with that, we realized that it would be irresponsible to prescribe large volume of unlicensed medicines without collecting this data in a robust way. So we've set up this real-world evidence platform that I'll also describe in some more detail, but that really hopes to achieve that and to really bring forward out the knowledge gap that we currently have in place. Um, and obviously it's important to bring the medical community with us uh, and really that is a, a matter of education and trust. So how do we evaluate patients at SAPA? Well, it, we evaluate them actually in, in almost an identical way to how I evaluate pancreas cancer patients in the NHS. Um, in that patients are seen by a specialist uh, in their condition. Uh, and after that, they are discussed in a multidisciplinary team. In the case of SAFA, we have at least seven clinicians. 
On top of that, we have a clinical pharmacist who helps with the prescribing and a medical director who uh, signs off all the prescriptions. And so this type of clinical governance process means that it is probably as robust as you can possibly get in terms of deciding if it's uh, the treatment is appropriate for an individual patient. Uh, those that receive a prescription uh, are entered into a registry data collection and then the circle uh, uh, continues. This is the sort of uh, patients that we see. As you can see, the majority are chronic pain, but as I mentioned before, neurology and psychiatry form uh, a reasonable uh, uh, proportion of that too. Um, and, and, and we've been uh, we've been mindful of the fact that uh, to be able to do this in a responsible way, i.e., allow large volume prescribing of medical cannabis, uh, we have to be more than just a clinic. Uh, and so, one of the things that we've done is we've uh, we've helped set up the Safa Medical Foundation, which is now an independent organisation with Baroness Molly Mitra as chair of trustees, uh, that uh, recognises the fact that. Uh, um, these treatments are unfortunately still going to be in the private sector, and although the prices are coming down, will still be uh, 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 unaffordable uh, for some. Uh, and this charity uh, um, allows for patients who don't have the financial means uh, and those who are deemed likely to benefit the most from treatment to have free treatment for a year. And, and, and um, the first round of, uh, of applications have gone in the beginning of last year, and there's patient currently being treated under the foundation, which is great. Um, so I mentioned that uh, we have placed great emphasis on the um, data acquisition platform. And so we've set up the UK Medical Cannabis Registry. Uh, and this really is um, a project that uh, has taken a long time to get right, but that we're very pleased uh, uh, to be able to roll out to any medical cannabis patient in the UK. Uh, where we collect data on efficacy measures, so how the medicines work for an individual patient, patient reported outcomes, adverse events, how your, for instance, for a pain patient, how the prescription of opioids may decrease over time. And we've found that patients really enjoy this, this type of uh, interaction uh, as to how, in, in, in reviewing their own treatment outcomes. Uh, and what, and what, this is, is that this forms the clinical data acquisition uh, for our real world evidence platform. And so in addition to data from wearables, biological samples, digital phenotyping, we're looking at electronic healthcare records. So administrative healthcare data sets, GP hospital clinical data sets, combining that with big data from social media, digital networks, to be able to come, to be able to derive this really rich source of data, which, not only is going to be helpful for clinical outcome analysis, and in some ways, as we're waiting on evidence from randomized trials to be built up, we'll be able to use for personalized medicine in clinical context, but this is also going to be important for drug development, so for post-marketing surveillance, and we've already had some interest from industry about how we can help them with that, uh, and obviously contribute to market authorization for various drugs, um, it's also going to be important to determine clinical trial endpoints. Um, and what I mean by that is, like I said before, for some of our pain patients, we've seen that what they tell us is that they have a real boost in their quality of life. But actually, when they say, oh, my pain's gone from, you know, on a score from eight to six, the, the, the real uh, underlying reason for that may be an improvement in their quality of sleep, or the fact that they have better functional outcomes, i.e. can wash their hair in the shower or something like that. And by being able to identify that in the data, we're going to be able to design clinical trials to really show what benefits patients. And those have the likely, the most likely chance of being positive in the end. And finally, of course, this, this kind of data is something that's going to be very interesting for policymakers as we move ahead in these uncharted waters. I'm going to finish on this slide, and this is just a plug for the Sapphire Institute for Medical Cannabis Education. This is a completely free online resource for uh, healthcare professionals and patients. Um, it's got a, a, a wide variety of different uh, educational tools, online webinars, CPD accredited e-learning modules, and so on. So if you have an interest, I urge you to register for that, which, as I said, is completely free to access. Um, 
I'm going to finish there. Um, my understanding is that we're going to take questions at the end. Hello, everybody. Um, I, I've received various WhatsApp messages while Michael was speaking, uh, wishing me luck following Michael. He's obviously a, a fantastic speaker and I've, I've definitely drawn the short straw, Jamie. So thank you for that. <laughs> the, good, the good news is he overran by five minutes, so you're going to get five minutes less of me. Um, I'm going to speak for a very short period of time uh, just on how some of the uh, changes in the UK and, and, and wider perhaps in Europe um, have created investment opportunities that I'm sure a number of the uh, attendees today are interested in. Um, and I, I'll start by briefly talking about some of the different uh, sectors that cannabis um, and the medical cannabis industry covers. Um, uh, Michael and Jamie spoke primarily about the UK market and in particular uh, the process by which patients can access medical cannabis um, from uh, doctors. The, the cannabis industry and the value in the cannabis industry for companies and, and potential investors is obviously much wider than that. On the slide we've got a few of the different uh, verticals. Um, I think when uh, the cannabis industry started, uh, particularly in North America um, and Canada primarily, all of the companies tried to be fully verti vertically integrated. That is, they would grow the cannabis, they would extract and manufacture the cannabin cannabinoid medicines, um, they would deal with distribution and marketing, uh, education of doctors, operate clinics, etc. Um, I think Europe has developed slightly differently. There, there are very few integrated companies in Europe, and there are more companies who specialize in one particular vertical, uh, or one in some cases, one particular country. Um, and I think given the stage of um, the market in Europe, I think we're going to see some consolidation uh, in, in 2021. Um, as some of those groups that are currently working together quite closely and quite well actually come together to form more integrated uh, companies with larger reach and more access to the product. Um, different people have different views on which uh, sectors are going to be uh, the ones to invest in uh, and we've got to be mindful of uh, new entrants to the market as the industry develops. In particular, large pharma companies will take an increasing interest in some of the work Michael's doing and will inevitably look to uh, enter the space, whether providing unlicensed medicines or, or, or authorised products. And in relation to wellness products, that there are obviously large FMCG groups, beauty groups, nutraceutical groups who will enter. And so some of the smaller operators uh, need to be mindful, obviously, that that will happen over time. At the moment, it is very much an industry dominated by startups, that, that there isn't really a large multinational established corporate that is trying to uh, enter the market currently, certainly in the UK. Um, there's also the possibility of the NHS. Uh, as Michael has said, he suggests it could be five to 10 years for some uh, uh, conditions. But certainly when the NHS does start providing uh, medical cannabis products, that, that will have an impact on the business of certain groups who are currently operating in what is, at the moment, 99% private market. Uh, as Jamie finished, I think the, the catalyst for uh, this uh, seminar and what's going to happen over the next 18 to 24 months, I suspect, is a recent statement by the FCA regarding cannabis companies uh, accessing uh, UK capital markets. And I think it's worth discussing briefly the, um, the position over the last two years. Two years ago, there was a lot of excitement regarding cannabis and there was a lot of startup companies uh, raising money and looking to get involved. Um, but due to a lack of regulatory clarity, primarily from the FCA, it was very difficult for institutional investors to uh, invest or in, in the startup companies and ultimately for those companies to raise meaningful capital, whether privately or using the capital markets. Um, 
the statement by the FCA provides significant clarity compared to where we were previously. The, the net effect of that, I, I would see on the ground, is that where two years ago we would have 100 companies trying to launch a wellness brand, uh, for example, there are now far fewer. And so by simply limiting companies' access to capital, uh, I think it is the case that the stronger companies with the better management have been able to survive. The companies that had an idea and, and little more than a, an investor presentation have fallen by the wayside. So in some ways, as an investor or an advisor in the space, the, the lack of regulatory uh, uh, clarity has helped everybody in the sense that the better companies with the better management are, the, are likely to be the ones who are now moving forward and have managed to maintain their business over the last two years. Um, I, I know on the call there are a number of uh, corporate finance and, and brokers and PR and, and similar firms that are looking to work with medical cannabis companies uh, over, following this uh, update from the FCA. Um, and we are seeing, again, uh, a reasonably regular uh, flurry of new inquiries from cannabis companies all over Europe who are looking to raise pre-IPO money, raise venture capital money, raise money from private equity, and in some cases ultimately seek a listing uh, on a stock market. Um, uh, and we expect that to continue. And so I, I, I would expect those companies to be reaching out to nomads, corporate finance advisors, um, seeking to appoint them as part of their uh, strategy as they move forward. The FCA change of position, uh, I'll spend a couple of minutes talking about that. Their previous concern had been that the legislation permitted uh, overseas companies to uh, not breach the proceeds of crime legislation where there was an equivalent licensing regime in place. And I think the FCA were unsure what constituted an equivalent licensing regime. And the delay, uh, certainly over the last six months, we understand in correspondence with the FCA has been the FCA reaching out to the Home Office in particular, seeking comfort that um, an equivalent licensing regime, which is there is no guidance for, covered Europe and, and the more established jurisdictions. And we understand the FCA have received that comfort. And so companies that, for example, have cultivation elsewhere in Europe, um, the fact that you're cultivating under a license issued in Spain or in Portugal or, or another jurisdiction, that will mean that the products you're potentially supplying to the UK or elsewhere in Europe, the proceeds from the sales of that product won't be proceeds of crime. Th th that has been the, the fundamental block on all of these companies raising capital from investors. On the basis that the FCA is now comfortable with that, it should mean that regulated uh, venture capital groups, regulated private equity groups, and ultimately uh, regulated markets uh, will be allowed or permitted or encourage um, listings and investment, and they can ha do so uh, in the knowledge that, that they won't have a proceeds of crime issue in the future. Uh, Hill Dickinson has been very active uh, advising cannabis companies since 2017, and, and we've certainly suffered uh, over the last two years in because of that lack of clarity. Um, it, it, a number of clients who made significant progress were stalled due to their inability to raise capital, inability to execute their plans to uh, list on stock markets or, 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 or raise meaningful private or venture capital. We have, however, had some significant successes in the sector despite these difficulties. Um, originally advising Fast Forward, uh, and subsequently on the IPO of Sativa and more recently on their uh, public takeover by Stilcana, a Canadian listed company. We obviously work with uh, Sapphire Medical Clinics um, and uh, uh, thank Michael again for speaking today. Um, in particular, 
our health and regulatory team is why we have succeeded in the space and, and, and we'd like to think why we've helped companies such as Sapphire build the platform they have and now as the situation becomes much clearer in terms of raising capital obviously we hope to help people like Sapphire grow their business further and faster and that's all I'll really say and I'll probably just invite questions um, now I, I should imagine there'll be more for Michael and Jamie but if anyone has any questions for me that's great and if, if not by all means email me or we can follow up on any inquiries that come through um, on here thank you Thanks very much. Thanks, Michael, and thank you, Michael, as well. I think we have a question from uh, uh, Director Michael Sodegren. What is the referral process to the Sapphire Clinic? Um, uh, well, it's very straightforward in that patients can uh, patients can self refer now. So it's a it's an online an online form. It takes about a minute to complete. Um, there's a number of admin steps uh, that uh, um, are on the Sapphire side. So we, we won't see any patients for whom we don't have their medical records, their uh, summary of care GP records. Uh, and so uh, ones that the patients can access those themselves or we can have uh, a, a dialogue with the GP or their specialist to access those records. Uh, but from the patient side, it's a very straightforward process now. Thanks, Michael. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? Um, feel free to put them in the, the chat box or uh, or unmute and introduce yourself and ask away. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, hi. Um, my name is Valentino Paravicini. I'm a CSO at Oxford Cannabinoid Technologies. Uh, a question for for Michael. Thank you. It was a great great talk. Um, I'm, I'm more interested in sort of a approach with a, with a regulator and and the agencies in general. A lot of the administration of these of these uh, drugs or pharmaceuticals would be through uh, a medical device. Uh, did you have any um, interaction with with the with the regulator about that and how is it possible, for example, to put together? a drug and a medical device as a unique uh, product device uh, drug. Um, is, I presume that is that question for me or for, yes, for, you, for you, Michael? For me, great. Yeah, yeah, no. OK, so um, yeah, so I mean, um, uh, on the research side, uh, I've been very interested in this uh, and I think that the current modes of administration of medical cannabis are suboptimal. Uh, you know, the, the the oils that we use, um, we don't have um, we don't have a, a reliable way of uh, understanding on a per patient basis. You know what the what the pharmacokinetics are like, what the pharmacodynamics are like, and so on. And so that needs to be improved. Um, there are a number of different very interesting concepts in the pipeline, and so from a research side, uh, that is something that we've most definitely been looking at. From a regulatory point of view, um, um, there are obviously um, issues related to how you can protect uh, these kind of um, devices and combination devices with therapeutics. I suppose that's that's another question. Uh, but from a regulatory point of view, it's 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 relatively straightforward, I think. And we've been uh, we've been looking at a number of different devices that are coming on the market, but the, the route is through a CE mark uh, and then uh, uh, evaluation like you would with any other new medical device. And, and that has to be clinical trials. Um, what I would say on the clinical side, uh, we, are, we, are, we are not uh, prescribing any novel devices to patients. Uh, we know that there may be one or two on the market, but the simple reason for that is the fact that we are prescribing an unlicensed medicine and to combine that unlicensed medicine for which we're still collecting data with uh, a, an untested, as it were, device, uh, whether it has C marking or not, that hasn't gone through the, the clinical trials and, and other mechanisms that we would expect, uh, just wouldn't seem sensible at this point. Uh, but I have no doubt that that is the future uh, further down the line. 
Thank you. Thanks, Michael. We've got a question here from from Skip to Michael Corcoran. Where in the supply chain are the best opportunities for capital raising? Um, where in the supply chain are the best opportunities for capital raising? I, I think in the short term, there is a great deal of interest in cultivation. I think there is a currently there is a supply demand imbalance. And if you take the German market um, as an example, my understanding and from clients and from, from uh, research in the area is if you can supply a product to Germany, you'll sell it because there isn't enough supply. Um, and so bringing on stream uh, EN, e, EU GMP authorized cultivation is probably the bottleneck in bringing down prices um, in the market. At, at the moment, the cultivators have uh, significant uh, leverage because there is such limited supply. I think in the medium term, cultivation would be a slightly riskier uh, vertical to, to focus on because inevitably uh, large scale industrial cultivation will take place in, in low cost jurisdictions uh, such as South America and possibly Africa and certain optimal southern European jurisdictions. And so at the moment, I think people who have existing cultivation with existing EU GMP, um, they are the ones that are best able to, to raise capital. In, in the medium term, I, th I, th I think that supply demand imbalance will be uh, addressed. And I think the value will, will move up the value chain closer to the distribution and it will be uh, more focused on the clinics and the uh, uh, the distribution and the pharmaceutical side, so the pharmacy side, and actually making sure the products reach the patients. Um, there is a, a very important uh, part of that, which is uh, the education uh, side of, of it for doctors, uh, and that will, I suspect, be a question of medical reps, conferences, and, and different companies promoting their different products, because ultimately, they need a doctor to prescribe their product. And at the moment, there are obviously multiple products on the market, all very similar. And to differentiate your product, other than by price, will require uh, education. And you'll be educating them on the research you've done, the trials you've done, the data you've collected to say, our product is better than theirs because of all this information we have and all the work we've done. So I, I think at the moment, the, the best opportunities are probably in cultivation. Uh, particularly amongst groups that are already cultivating, but I do expect that to get uh, the value chain, the, the real opportunity to, to, to move closer to the patient uh, distribution uh, uh, side. Does that answer the question? Great, Michael, there's a follow on question as well, uh, which is from Carlos about, about are we, um, I assume Carlos means looking at investments in South America, and if so, any particular country. Um, we Hill Dickinson definitely aren't, <laughs> um, uh, but we are working with companies that are looking to establish relationships with South American cultivation companies. In terms of jurisdictions, I think Uruguay is probably the most advanced. They are, along with Canada, one of the two companies that has a fully legal recreational market. So they have a relatively established cultivation uh, industry in uh, Uruguay. They don't have the EU GMP approvals and a number of the cultivators there are working to, to, to build that. Um, there are also groups working, uh, cultivating in Colombia um, and Argentina um, and I think yes, I, I you know I I don't think it's necessarily the next twelve or twenty four months, but I, I expect the long term development of the industry to have cannabis as a commodity, as with tobacco, as with I realise they're at different ends of the health spectrum, but it, we're not expecting the far just as British American tobacco doesn't grow its own tobacco, we're not expecting the cannabis companies and the pharma companies to grow their own uh, cannabis. We expect that to be done by large scale cultivators in the best best climates. OK, thank you, Michael. I think uh, we are bang on 10 o'clock. So um, 
thank you everybody for joining. Um, if there are any other questions, please do uh, send them through to the email addresses uh, at the end of the slides um, and we will also be in touch uh, to follow up as well. So thank you very much everybody for listening in. Thank you everybody. Thank you Michael. Thank you. Thank you.